means, like you said, the abortion pill, uh, it, all the regulations around it, access to it remain the same. There's been no major change as of this Thursday morning. Uh, but that could be very different come Saturday morning. And um, I, it also suggests to me, Brad, that the Supreme Court has, in fact, probably voted and made a decision uh, on this uh, on this issue. And right now huh. they're spending some time writing furious dissents uh, on one side or the other. Oh, that's interesting. You're saying like if it was unanimous, they would just put out the thing. But now it, they've taken a vote. It's not unanimous. And now they're going to like take a day or two to write all their stuff. Like what, what can you glean as to like who's doing what? Well, there's a lot of different ways the court could go here. But there are kind of four big buckets. One, they could deny the government's request to stay those restrictions on mifepristone, uh, really upending the status quo, throwing the drug into regulatory disarray, uh, limiting access to the drug in broad swaths of the country, even in places where abortion is legal. Or they could stay those lower court restri restrictions for the duration of this legal battle. They could also take a third option. They could come up with some intermediary stay. Certain portions of the Texas judge's ruling uh, could go into effect, others not. And then the big question, Brad, the fourth option is should the court, would the court take up this case on the merits? Expedite it. Hear all arguments and debate in the courtroom as early as next month and author an opinion. Oh, like the judge made his ruling and the Fifth Circuit was going to rule on the judge's ruling. The Supreme Court's like, move over Fifth Circuit. Like, you don't even have to do anything. We got it from here. Yeah, they're scheduled to hear the case May 17th, but to skip over that and just to get right to it, uh, we'll see if the justices have an appetite to do that. Yeah, I'm wondering sort of what hypotheticals you see. Because if it comes down to liberals versus conservatives, you'd expect at least somewhat of a conservative ruling, right? But I don't even know what that would look like here. Well, at its heart, this is actually not a case about abortion. It's not a case about abortion rights. This is about the FDA's authority and what federal law requires of our agencies when they enact policies. There are certain steps, things they have to do. They can't just act in an arbitrary and capricious manner when they set policy. And so um, each of these intermediary steps around mifepristone over the years where the FDA has updated their guidelines all of those have come under attack, and the justices could say, well, you know, the most recent policy revisions just last year, uh, allowing the drug to be sent through the mail, um, you know, that was done in an arbitrary and capricious manner. That needs to be looked at, uh, for example. Oh, they could say mail is like the thing. Exactly. There could be some sort of an order that simply... Uh, puts, uh, you know, puts this uh, stop on uh, the mailing of mifepristone into effect just, just as a hypothetical and keeping everything else on hold. So there are different gradients that they could, that they could uh, enact here. Devin, what's so confusing about this, though, is like, we were told when President Trump nominated and got these conservative justice confirmed that th they would argue for this to be a state-by-state -state issue, right? And that's indeed what we saw. Like Dobbs made it so that there was no national right to abortion. All the states got to do whatever they want. But now does it feel like we're suddenly living in a country where for the foreseeable future on a pretty regular basis, we're just all on pins and needles awaiting new nationwide abortion rules that can change overnight? And that's certainly what abortion rights advocates are saying about this juncture in this long-running debate. They're pointing to the words of Justice Kavanaugh uh, and others from the Dobbs decision last year uh, when he said policy decisions should be left to policymakers. And here the court is right back in the middle of it again. Uh, on the flip side of that, Brad, conservatives and likely conservative justices see this as an administrative issue. They, you know, substitute any other policy or decision um, equally co as contentious as abortion, and it would be the same kind of a case. Mm. Did the FDA follow the proper administrative guidelines under the Administrative Procedures Act, the APA? Um, you know, and that is where, you know, this decision in this Texas court, granted it is widely considered considered to be an extreme decision, um, that ruling was based entirely on the procedures that the FDA was supposed to follow, uh, which he concluded they did not follow, but which independent studies have said the agency did abide by over the years. And that's where the debate is, and that's why I think the conservative justices here um, could find reason to really engage on this, seeing it not so much as an issue directly involved with abortion rights, but about policy and the power of agencies. And when you say engage on this, that, that means that like actually charting perhaps a new course, at least in the short term, for what access to the abortion pill looks like. All right, Devin Dwyer there in Washington. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Next up on Start here, 70% of the earth is covered by water, but how much that water is now covered by plastic? We'll break it down after the break. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. For over 20 years, we've given some real-life superhero moms the mother of all surprises. Oh, my goodness! It's GMA's Breakfast in Bed. This is amazing. I had no idea. And now, this year, we want to give our biggest, most epic live Mother's Day surprise yet to the most deserving mom. Oh, my goodness. So go now to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter to share your mom's story and honor her the GMA way. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. And watch Boston Strangler, starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. This weekend, as you might know, it's Earth Day. It's on Saturday. And in the lead up to Earth Day, ABC News has been spending this whole week reporting out environmental stories that are shaping this planet we live on. In fact, this year, ABC specifically homed in on water, how water is being affected by our actions, how it's affecting lives around the world, and what can be done to improve it. And you might remember last year, we did this story about how for all the talk about recycling plastic, plastic is actually way more difficult to deal with than other recyclable materials. And since then, I've kind of been obsessed with where this unrecycled plastic goes. And so as part of the series focusing on water, Start Here decided to take a look at something that literally goes unseen, but which is becoming a bigger and bigger issue right before our eyes. We're going to spend the rest of the show on this, and we're going to Erie, Pennsylvania. Of the five Great Lakes, Lake Erie has the least water in it, and yet on a clear spring morning, looking north toward Canada, you still can't see the other side. These aren't just large lakes. Some scientists call the Great Lakes freshwater seas. Together, they account for 20% of our fresh water. And I don't mean 20% for the U.S. or 20% for North America. No, 20% of all fresh water on Earth. And in Lake Erie, scientists have begun to wrap their minds around how much of that water has plastic in it. Plastic you can't even see. See a dead fish and a wrapper probably from what, like a Pop-Tart? Yeah. <laughs> and that's just the beginning. <laughs> that's Sherry Mason, whose entire job revolves around studying plastic in your water. She's the director of sustainability at Penn State University's bar campus on Lake Erie. She's got long hair, a jolly laugh, and a tiny two-seat smart car that we've piled into. Okay, so what are we doing today? Today, I am going to take you on a trash tour. And yeah, we're going on a trash tour. We are following the path of plastic as it makes its way into the water system, which is why we're now standing next to a huge railroad car on the side of the road. <laughs> I know when we think of plastic pollution, we think of plastic at the end of its life. You're thinking of like plastic bottles and stuff. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about that story too. But I wanted to take you here because this is plastic at the beginning of its life, and even here, it's already polluting. Before plastic gets pressed into a so, shape, like a water bottle or a Ziploc bag or a bicycle helmet, it starts off as these tiny little plastic pellets that get fed into great giant machines. These pellets are a little bit bigger than a grain of rice, and they're carried by the millions on rail cars like this one. Here we go. Oh, look at these. Yeah, so these are these pellets. So when they disconnected the hose, this pile of pellets spilled out. Sherry is holding a little pile in her hands, right under one of these rail cars. There are dozens of these little piles up and down the track. And if you bend down, you can see on the other, there's two railroad tracks, right? And what's on the other side? That is Mill Creek. 
It's oh, a that's water like a waterway. Bay. Yeah. Whenever a there's a storm, bay. these pellets of plastic start making their way into Mill Creek. From there, they start their journey to Lake Erie, to Lake Ontario, to the Atlantic Ocean, to all the world's oceans. Thousands of miles from any land, the vastness of the ocean is giving way to what some say is the largest garbage dump in the world. And in the last 10 years or so, scientists have noticed something about these freshwater seas. They're beginning to resemble some of the most notorious parts of saltwater oceans. It's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's mostly plastic, which in the middle of the Pacific, you might have heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's an accumulation of trash that all seem to find each other. It's a floating landfill that's twice the size of Texas. Multiple studies have now found the concentration of plastic in Lake Erie rivals that of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So what is this? So this, when those street sweepers come by, you can see them actually over there. Oh, yeah. Um, they come here. This is where they dump everything that they collect. We're standing now so, in a garbage facility in downtown Erie in front of a pile of dirt and trash that's larger than a house. I mean, this is, we've only, we're like, what, April 6th? And they just started doing street sweeper operations April 1st. Oh, this trash is all from like this week? Yeah. This, <laughs> which is, it's taller than us. Like This is the stuff that's picked like, up by local street sweepers before it can make its way to local waterways. But as you drive around, you can see they don't pick up everything. This area is is referred to as a as a food swamp. We're in East Erie now. It's a part of town where a lot of working poor folks live and where lots of litter is blowing around. We don't have grocery stores, but we do have a lot of convenience stores. Sherry gets frustrated when she hears about litter. She says it's easy to blame people for being careless with trash when fast food joints are shoving it into their hands, when they don't have a car to store it in. Oh, I hate the term litter bug, in part because I know the history of it. And I didn't even know this, but litter bug was a phrase coined by a marketing group hired by plastic makers back Back in the 50s, single-use products were becoming cheaper to make, but they were getting everywhere. So this was their first pivot. The problem is not the product. The problem is the people. People are litter bugs. You don't want to be a bug. Don't litter. You know, so... And yet here in this neighborhood, until just a few years ago, it was illegal to put your garbage out in a can. You had to put it out in a loose plastic bag where a raccoon would inevitably drag everything out overnight. Meaning, when you walk up to a random storm drain, you start to see trash making its way into the water system. So right here, we're seeing a, a plastic bottle stuck in the, the grate. It will sit there, right? And as it does, it's the sun is shining on it and it's becoming more and more brittle. And then a car is gonna drive over it and it's gonna fracture into to smaller pieces of plastic. And this is and really why is we're here today. The story of these garbage patches in the Great yeah. Lakes is not about intact plastic water bottles. In fact, if you go out into the middle of the lake, you're not gonna see a floating landfill. It still looks like fresh water. Except if you look close, within that water, there's a growing number of microscopic pieces of plastic called microplastics. That is what Sherry studies. Microplastic just refers to any piece of plastic that's smaller than five millimeters, which is a weird unit. So just kind of picture uh, an eraser at the end of your pencil or your fingernail. Um, she says picture a plastic bag that gets caught in a tree somewhere. It looks gross, looks like litter. That is not what concerns her the most. The bigger problem is what happens next. They, they are exposed to sunlight, makes them really brittle. And then when you have mechanical abrasion, like cars driving over it or people walking on it or wind and water, it breaks into these ever smaller pieces. And once Throughout its life, plastic breaks, cracks, chips away. It gets smaller and smaller. Quickly, you see little bits of that plastic bag strewn around the neighborhood. And unlike other types of litter, those bits will never, ever disappear. So if you were to like see a paper bag on the side of the road, it's unsightly, but within weeks, it has completely what we call mineralized. There are organisms in the soil that can use it as a food source. A paper bag like can return light. to the elements of the earth within weeks. The bits of that plastic bag will be around for decades or even centuries, just getting smaller and smaller. Hello. It rained overnight. Oh, yeah, it's been raining a lot. Ooh, ooh, look at this. Oh man, so much. 
We've pulled up to the spot where Mill Creek enters the bay that leads into Lake Erie. And for someone who hates litter, Sherry is really excited to see so much litter. So much trash. <laughs> so much trash. <laughs> we, th this, this is why it's called a trash tour. You We're standing say. at a litter boom, so basically a floating rope that guides any floating stuff off into a little cove before it goes out into the bay. It's not foolproof. Some plastic sinks. A simple storm can send stuff barreling over. But there's enough collected here that the sanitation department regularly comes by to clean this cove out with a backhoe. And just from where we started upstream, you can now see how small these pieces have gotten. You can see, like, that purple piece. <laughs> you know, you can see... Yeah, like, what is that? Oh, there's a Nerf dart. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, that could have come from, you know, an Easter egg. As part of her research, <laughs> Sherry and her students spent a year pulling trash out of here themselves, sorting, categorizing, even separating by brands to see whose stuff ends up out here most often. And back at her lab, we go over what she found. This is what a, ch a year of trash looks like. We're in a shed on Penn State's bar campus, standing in front of dozens of clear trash bags. Thousands of bottles is the number one thing, bottles and cups, and then a lot of um, chip bags. It's mostly food packaging. And in a weird way, what we're looking at here is the success story, right? This is all the stuff that could have made it into the water system, but didn't. It was swept up by street sweepers or cleaned out of the storm grates or in a last-ditch effort was swept aside by that litter boom. It's after this point that sun, water, and friction break it down from litter into smaller and smaller chunks. Sherry describes it as a smog of particles drifting around, which also makes it impossible to meaningfully clean up once it's out on the lake. I'm not trying to be an idiot. Yeah, here. no, that's But, like, I'm not seeing little chunks of plastic floating around in it. No. Well, I mean, one, you're not really looking for it. But, again, most of this plastic is, is microplastic. So the vast majority of that plastic is actually about the width of a human hair. This is when I learned about nanoplastics, when those pieces from a plastic bag or a toy Easter egg just keep splitting off into pieces so small you can't even see them. They're still there, though. All right, we're going to see if we can zoom in on some stuff here. In her lab, Sherry shows me microscopic images of bottled water. Oh, my gosh, there's even, like, tinier ones than I... Because it looks tiny in the dish. Like, there's bits I can see. Yeah. But you can see... And then there's bits... Yeah. ...even smaller. That's crazy. Here, she actually draws an important distinction between tap water and bottled water. For one, public tap water filtration systems use technology that can actually isolate particulates, even microscopic ones. The issue with bottled water is that it's still housed in plastic, which means it's constantly shedding smaller bits of plastic into that water, the way that we're constantly shedding skin. We are drinking plastic. We are eating plastic. These pieces have become so small that we are breathing plastic. We've looked in poop and there's plastic in our poop. So we know that this plastic is making its way into our bodies. So then the question is, what does that impact? Because of the sheer amount of plastic particles now floating around us every day, it's estimated to be currently in just about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Just imagine knife and fork, cutting up a credit card really tiny and choking it down once a week. Which, if it went straight through your digestive tract, might not actually be the hugest issue in the world. The World Health Organization says more research is needed, but it's found no direct evidence that microplastic makes us sick. Plastic industry groups say the bottles we drink out of are safe, meeting or exceeding all federal guidelines. But again, these pieces are getting so small, they're finding their way beyond the digestive tract. When you get a piece that's smaller than 100 microns or the width of a human hair, they can migrate across the gastrointestinal tract. They get carried in the blood. We have found them in the blood. And they can make their way into certain organs. They can make their way across the placental boundary. There's another concern here besides the literal chunks of plastic. In addition to these particles, there are chemicals sprayed onto all these products. Plasticizers to make them pliable. UV stabilizers to slow down their deterioration. Colorants to brand them. Those chemicals are in the plastic, but they're not bound to the plastic. They're not married, <laughs> right? They're like dating. The Plastic and Industry so Association, which represents plastic makers, told us claims about microplastics, quote, lack sound data and that plastic's overwhelmingly safe. In fact, they said plastics are essential to hygiene. That's why you see them in so many medical products. But the use of plastics practically everywhere, making them the standard, that concerns Sherry. She sees this year as an inflection point. 
I think when most people hear about hydrofracking, they think of natural gas. The Midwest right now is in the midst of a fracking boom. Half the fracking wells in Pennsylvania produce something besides what you would use for energy. Instead of methane, they produce ethane. Ethane can be cracked and turned into ethylene, which can then be turned into polyethylene, the most common plastic that is manufactured. So there is now a connection between basically hydrofracking and the plastics industry. And this build out is happening as we speak right now. Last so. year, a new plant went online just north of Pittsburgh, converting this material into plastic. Two more facilities are being proposed right next door in Ohio. For all the focus on going green, she says, make no mistake, more plastic is on the way. The Center for International Environmental Law says the health of the fossil fuel industry is deeply reliant on plastics and that these big investments could cause plastic production to spike. On our right is Presque Isle Bay and on our left, though you can't see it, is Lake Erie. We're now driving toward the Presque Isle Peninsula and I finally ask Sherry, what do you want to happen? Like in a perfect world, do you ban plastic? She says no, though she would like to see cash recycling deposits in all 50 states, but in her mind, Ultimate responsibility lies with the companies making this stuff. In my mind, if you go to buy a product, right, say a, a, a soda pop, right, you want the product, not the container that it came in. But you get the container because you want the product and you don't really have a control over that. In a free market, you're not uh, supposed to have to ban things because companies will respond to what consumers want. So some folks might prefer glass like, bottles, some might prefer uh, plastic because it's lighter and less breakable. But either way, no company thinks people are going to stop buying their products solely because of slightly cheaper uh, packaging. For communities, though, the real cost of that plastic remains deceptively high. It's like you've given your money to that corporation, you end up with their container which you don't want, but then you also have to pay to get rid of it? You have to pay to clean it out of the water? We pay for you know, the street sweepers. We pay for the recycling plants, the litter booms. Everything in our trash tour has been on the taxpayer. Sherry thinks more plastic makers should be charged for that stuff. Coca-Cola, which sells more plastic bottles than anyone else on Earth, says it's putting money into community recycling programs and that by 2030, it's committed to cleaning up a bottle for every bottle it produces. A big statement in a world where the recycling rate is currently less than 10%. As we arrive on the shoreline of Lake Erie, the wind is whipping, the waves are breaking. So here's Hi. Lake Erie. <laughs> uh, this is Lake Erie. It's a little bit windy. It's a little, she's a little bit feisty. There's a lot of, of churning happening. So you see how brown she is. Different times of the year, she would be much more blue. That churn is so powerful that it's turned rocks into sand. Now it turns plastic into microplastics, then nanoplastics. But Sherry is quick to say all is not lost. There's still plenty of stuff big enough to grab. In fact, she quickly bends down and finds a bottle cap, and then the prong and a disposable fork. Yeah. Here, you can take these with oh, you. Oh, thank you. It's your, like... <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna start your collection, like what I have oh, no. in my lab. You can't take me. You can't take me anywhere. I'm always picking up trash. <laughs> it's a real issue. I'm always picking up trash, she says. It's not going back in this lake if she can help it. Okay, that'll do it for us. We got some other incredible stories leading up to Earth Day across all of ABC's platforms, so really be sure to check those out. Remember, voting for the Webby Awards ends today. So if you want to see more reporting like this, what you just heard, Inside Scoop, awards like this really go a long way in hyping up these types of projects. So if you're able to follow the link in the show description, that will let you vote before tonight's deadline. Really appreciate it. I'm Brian Milkey. I'm off tomorrow, but we got Michelle Franzen breaking down all the news of the day. I'll see you next week. It's my very first trash tour. What? <laughs> Leave me a positive review on Yelp. Trash Yelp. <laughs>
America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. The greatest and biggest scandal in chess history. I was shocked. This is the greatest story in the chess world. What's it like to be named in a $100 million loss? Uh, surprising. This was huge for global headlines and one of the first times that chess was on everyone's radar. This is bigger than chess. These allegations were huge. Holy <laughs> That was my reaction. <laughs> this is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Faith Abube, reporting from the Tennessee State Capitol. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Phil Lipoff. Today on ABC News Live, the trail of destruction following deadly tornadoes in the heartland. More than a dozen twisters touching down in three states. Oklahoma getting slammed with massive hail. Homes, churches, and businesses destroyed. Our team is in the hard-hit county. The Supreme Court delaying its decision on the access to the abortion pill, what the ruling could mean for millions of women all across the country. An IRS whistleblower claiming the federal investigation into Hunter Biden is being mishandled. ABC News learning the president's son is allegedly getting preferential treatment. We are on Capitol Hill with the latest there. The new photo of Ralph Yarl as he recovers at home after being shot when he rang the wrong doorbell. This as the man who shot him makes his first court appearance. And the power of water, our Ginger Z taking us face to face with manatees what's being done to rescue these gentle giants. But we begin with the trail of destruction after a deadly tornado outbreak in the heartland. At least two people are dead after more than a dozen twisters slammed Oklahoma, Kansas, and Iowa. Now, search and rescue crews are working to find people who are still trapped. Our Maria Villarreal is in one of the hardest hit areas, Shawnee, Oklahoma, with the latest. A deadly outbreak of twisters across three states, leaving a trail of destruction. I got confirmation on the tornado. It is right in front of me. Eight reported tornadoes touching down just in Oklahoma. AccuWeather capturing this one moving through the town of Cole. In McLean County, at least two people dead. Multiple reports of injuries and people trapped in shelters. Oh. Hundreds and hundreds of first responders going in to make sure that everyone made it out okay. Shawnee, Oklahoma getting hit hard. This is the Lowe's hardware store, and it looks like some of the roof took a lot of damage from the storm. I can see a lot of the roofing out into the parking lot area. That's so sad. Heavy winds, damaging buildings, toppling trees, downing power lines, and wrecking cars. My car is literally not where I left it. Now it's over there with some roof on it. All the windows are shattered. This twig turned into a flying missile, punching a hole through the steel of this car door, while this assisted living facility destroyed, leaving dozens without shelter. The girls had started getting people in their bathrooms and then pulling people away from the windows, so they're the heroes tonight. And Maria Varial joins me now from Shawnee with uh, with more on this. Maria, you are in one of the hardest hit areas there. Um, we just finished covering more tornado damage in the south. I was in Mississippi. The damage is also heartbreaking. What is it like there right now? You know, Phil, the toughest part right now is infrastructure. I'm trying not to move around too much because cell service just in this area is very difficult to stay stabilized for us. Uh, that's because right now all of the power lines are down. There is debris everywhere. It is making it very difficult for crews to get in. Start the cleanup process with a lot of families. Uh, they have told us that while damage has been done to their neighborhoods, it could have been way worse. 
All right, Maria, thanks so much from Shawnee, Oklahoma, and some of the devastation we are seeing as people wake up this today. Uh, and the severe weather is on the move. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, uh, has where it's headed next. Ginger. Phil, unfortunately, we will see that same potent storm create more violent activity this afternoon. It looks like big hail will start it all out. I think Dallas-Fort Worth, watch for that early afternoon, so 2, 3 p.m. It'll open up into more of a linear look, meaning a long line anywhere from St. Louis down to San Antonio, damaging wind, and you could still see tornadoes spin up in here. So that's the area for tonight. Then it kind of shifts, and we get a new little low-pressure system that's going to bulge the middle of that out toward the southeast. So that includes Wilmington, almost to Raleigh. Uh, along the Outer Banks there, down to Charleston and Savannah. Included there, that's of course for Saturday, right? That's the damaging winds primarily on Saturday. For the Northeast, it's going to be in heavy rain, mid-Atlantic too. So if you have plans in the afternoon for Washington, D.C., uh, in the evening for Philadelphia, and the overnight looks like after 9 p.m. New York City, you get some of that heavy rain that could have some pretty, you know, wake you up thunderstorms as well. Phil? All right, Ginger, thanks so much. Sources tell ABC News uh, Superior at the IRS has told lawmakers he has information that suggests the Biden administration could be handling the investigation into President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, better. In a letter obtained by ABC News, the whistleblower makes claims of preferential treatment by the Department of Justice. Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas with the latest. ABC News learning that an IRS whistleblower is challenging assurances by the Justice Department that the investigation into Hunter Biden is not being watered down. The U.S. attorney in Delaware has been uh, advised that he has full authority. He has been advised that uh, he is not to be denied uh, anything that he needs. It's not restricted in his investigation in any way. But in a letter to Congress obtained by ABC News, an attorney representing an IRS agent who claims to be involved in the case says his client knows of details of preferential treatment and politics improperly infecting decisions in the investigation. He's lost sleep over whether to come forward. And, you know, at the end of the day, he's decided that he would feel worse about himself if he did nothing and stayed quiet. The attorney for the agent whose name is being withheld until he gets whistleblower status does not name the target of the probe. But sources telling ABC News he's talking about Hunter Biden. The president's son, who says his name will be cleared, has been under investigation by the Justice Department since during the Trump administration. One front of the investigation involving his taxes, another involving whether he made a false statement on a gun purchasing form. Sources told ABC News that last fall, the FBI and ATF concluded there is enough evidence to bring charges on both fronts. There is an ongoing investigation run by the U.S. attorney out of Delaware from the prior administration. Our Baltimore field office is working very hard with that U.S. attorney, and I expect them to pursue that case. But after all these months, no resolution from a Trump-appointed U.S. attorney who the Biden administration and attorney general have allowed to remain in place to avoid the appearance of meddling. But despite those assurances, the Hunter Biden case will now likely get even more scrutiny. The Republican chairman of the House Oversight Committee is demanding answers, and he's accusing the Biden administration of blocking efforts to bring tax charges against Hunter Biden. Phil? All right, Pierre Thomas, thank you for that. And now to the Supreme Court, delaying its decision on whether to wade into the legal battle over an abortion pill. Justices, considering a Texas's judge, a judge ruling that revokes the, drug, the drug's FDA approval, effectively banning the pill's use, even in states where abortion is legal. Senior National Correspondent Terry Moran joins me now, along with Senior National Policy Reporter Ann Flaherty. Uh, good to see both of you. Terry, let's begin with you. Uh, for, for folks in this country who are not following this saga as close as we are, what's the latest on the delay? And again, remind folks what's at stake here. Okay, so right now, the abortion pill, mifepristone, remains available to American women in the same way that it has been for years. But that may very well change by tomorrow at midnight. And that's because uh, the Supreme Court gave itself, the justices gave themselves a little bit more time. They extended their own self-imposed deadline until tomorrow at midnight to consider this very, very sweeping ruling by a federal judge in Texas uh, that would sharply limit access to the abortion pill. Uh, the judge ordered restrictions that would 
for example, uh, approve the pill only for the first seven weeks of pregnancy. Right now, it's 10 weeks. Require three in-person doctor visits before a woman could get that pill. Uh, instead of the current one uh, doctor's appointment, uh, and telehealth is available to accomplish that. And no longer allow the pill to be used to be uh, available by mail. So th those are some of the sweeping restrictions that this judge ordered. Right now, there's a timeout on those uh, restrictions. And so the Supreme Court is considering what to do as the Justice Department brought an appeal. They've got a couple of uh, options. They could let those restrictions go into place, and that would change access to the abortion pill across America. They could let the case below continue to litigate and, and hold those restrictions, or they could take up the case themselves. And for the second time, in less than a year, the, the conservative justice would have the power to decide women's access uh, to abortion services just a year after they overturned Roe versus Wade. So much at stake. And as I say, we'll know by midnight tomorrow. Should. And critics say this judge's ruling is not based in science. I mean, he's a judge, not a scientist. Uh, what, what is the precedent that is set here if a judge can go after, you know, an FDA-approved drug? Yeah, Phil, so the, the, the scope of this lawsuit is absolutely huge. We've talked to pharmaceutical executives, uh, biotech companies that say this could absolutely overturn how we see drugs in this company and how who gets to decide what is safe. So we've interviewed, for example, one doctor that worked on sickle cell research who said, you know, look, we're not going to go ahead and, and go after uh, drugs that if we think that a judge can overturn an FDA approval simply for political reasons. So, you know, we were talking about this before. Could there be something, somebody going after Viagra, birth control, um, you know, really anything that's on the table? And it, it, we were that talking just- talking about that Comstock law. Uh, and, well, and if you're gonna go by that, by the letter of the law, yeah, you could go after a drug like Viagra through the mail, right? Yeah, and I think that Comstock, well, so Comstock Act, what it does is it bans anything that is an abortion being sent through the mail. That is a big vulnerability for the abortion rights movement. And I think that they know that. And it's it's difficult, they say it doesn't apply. I think it depends on what judge you get. It's a very difficult thing that they're going to have to address because this isn't just about mailing it to a patient. This is about mailing it from the manufacturers to uh, the healthcare provider so that they can provide the abortion pill to people. So it's a real vulnerability that they're going to have to address. And of course, that was put in place during the Civil War era. Right. Very, very old, but still on the books. It's still a problem. Still a big problem, Legally. yeah. All right. And Flaherty and Terry Moran, thank you both very much. The Manhattan District Attorney is investigating the collapse of a New York City parking garage that killed one worker and injured seven. New video showing the moment that garage collapsed. Take a look at this, sending cars plummeting from floor to floor. The New York City Fire Department is now working to methodically take down the building. Trevor Alt is on the scene for us. New video inside that New York City parking garage capturing the moment it collapsed. My whole apartment shook like an earthquake. Every floor pancaking to the ground, cars tossed into a pile of rubble, injuring seven people and killing the building manager, who neighbors say was trying to leave for the day when the structure caved in. Demolition workers seen here methodically removing each car one by one, trying to avoid further collapse of the unstable structure. Right now we're transitioning to uh, how we safely take down that building, and it's incredibly complex. The Manhattan District Attorney says his office will investigate the cause. Sources say they're focused on the weight from those 50 cars on the roof and also noting the building's age, constructed in 1925. And a building that's 100 years old, you, you're going to have these defects. According to the Department of Buildings records, the garage has several open violations, including one deemed hazardous from 2003, citing defective concrete exposed with rear cracks. The mayor's office, though, confirms the garage's owners did make repairs to that problem in 2010 and was not cited in future inspections, though they neglected to file the necessary paperwork to close out the citation. Still, the sudden collapse raises concerns about aging structures particularly those with visibly cracked concrete. And we have now heard from the owners of this parking garage who tell us they're fully cooperating with city agencies and other authorities who are investigating this collapse. The demolition crews now as they continue to take down the rest of the structure piece by piece, they say their goal is to make sure they don't do any damage to the surrounding buildings. Phil. 
All right, Trevor Alt from New York City, thank you. In the meantime, coming up, the new photo of 16-year-old Ralph Yarl after being shot when he rang the wrong doorbell, what we are learning about his recovery. Also ahead, the family of the young woman shot dead after the car she was in turned into the wrong driveway is now speaking out. This amid the string of shootings across the country, the latest developments when we come back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back. Ralph Yarl, the Kansas City teen who was shot after ringing the wrong doorbell, appears to be making a remarkable recovery. The family's lawyer released a new photo showing the teen on the mend as the man who shot him appears in court entering a plea of not guilty. Alex Perez is in Kansas City, Missouri for us with the latest. Alex. Hey, Phil, this was Andrew Lester's first appearance in court since the shooting a week ago today. Now, the 84-year-old entered a not guilty plea in court. He's charged with felony assault and armed criminal action. Lester, prosecutors say, twice shot 16-year-old Ralph Yarl after the teen mistakenly rang the doorbell at Lester's home, thinking it was a different house. Yarl, who is picking up his two younger siblings, suffered life-threatening injuries, authorities say. He had emergency surgery to remove bullet fragments from his skull but his recovery has been remarkable. After that critical treatment, he was well enough to be released from the hospital Saturday. And this morning, our first look at Jarl at home. This picture shared by the family attorney, the teenager outdoors sitting on a bench smiling. His family says he is talking and they believe it is a miracle that he is alive. Now, Phil, that homeowner is due back in court June 1st. If convicted, he could face life in prison. Phil? Alex Perez from Kansas City. Alex, thank you. And that shooting in Kansas City is just one in a string of new and troubling shootings all across America. Ariel Reshef with more on that. Why did you shoot my daddy and me? Daddy shoot a kid's dad. A six-year-old girl and her parents recovering after they were shot by a neighbor, all because of an errant basketball. Authorities say 24-year-old Robert Lewis Singletary grabbed a gun and approached a group of children after the basketball from their street game rolled into his driveway. According to police, William White, the father of six-year-old Kingsley, noticed Singletary and tried to draw gunfire toward himself to protect the children before being shot in the back. He is still in the hospital. Authorities launching a massive manhunt for Singletary, who remains on the loose. That shooting just one of several causing alarm across the country. 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis was shot and killed in upstate New York when the car she was in pulled into the wrong driveway. Kevin Monahan, the man who allegedly fired the deadly shot, appearing in court Wednesday, charged with second-degree murder in connection with her death, the judge denying bail. The 65-year-old accused of shooting at a car full of young friends after they say they mistakenly turned into his driveway in a rural area 60 miles from Albany, New York, Saturday evening. Gillis in the front passenger seat, struck by a single bullet. Kaylin deserves to have her story told. And what a beautiful person she was. And in this grocery store parking lot, just outside of Austin, Peyton Washington, Heather Roth, and two other members of the Woodlands Elite Cheer Company were heading home from practice when Roth says she tried to get into a car she thought belonged to her and saw a man inside. I just saw like a black figure in the passenger seat and I shut the door as fast as I could. 
She ran back to her friend's car when the man approached her vehicle. And then he just threw his hands up and then he pulled out a gun. And then he just started shooting at all of us. Roth was grazed by a bullet in the gunfire. Washington suffered serious injuries and was taken to the hospital. Police say the suspected gunman, Pedro Rodriguez, is now in custody. Makes you realize what you take for granted pretty quickly that you do every single day when you never expect it to happen to you. How often do we hear we never thought it could happen here? Mass shootings have escalated to a record pace with at least 162 reported in 2023. And Phil, we are only in April. Stunning. Ariel, thank you so much for that. And coming up, the manatee miracle in Crystal River. How a Florida community came together after the storm of the century 30 years ago to rescue and restore their habitat. Stay with us. Tonight, the abortion pill ruling, millions waiting on the Supreme Court. Plus, after three shootings in a week over apparent mistakes, the new debate over gun laws. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. For over 20 years, we've given some real-life superhero moms the mother of all surprises. Oh my it's GMA's Breakfast in Bed. This is amazing. I had no idea. And now, this year, we want to give our biggest, most epic live Mother's Day surprise yet to the most deserving mom. Oh my goodness. So go now to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter to share your mom's story and honor her the GMA way. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Welcome back. The manatee population in one part of Florida is now growing after years of dangerous decline. Their ecosystem was almost wiped out when the Crystal River was devastated by a massive storm 30 years ago. Our Ginger Z is in the Sunshine State with more. Oh, there's two. Wow. It's a magical moment, getting a glimpse of Florida's gentle giants, the manatee. They congregate here every winter in Crystal River, which boasts bathtub clear water just off Florida's west coast. The Crystal River is fed by more than 70 freshwater springs that I'm in right now. They stay 72 degrees year round. That's warmer than the ocean in the winter months. So they become a critical winter habitat for more than 800 manatee. On March 12th of 1993, this critical ecosystem was wiped out by a devastating storm, dubbed the storm of the century. It virtually killed all the vegetation. It's a lot of salt water that came in here and the freshwater vegetation couldn't take it. It has taken decades, fueled by community advocates and more than $40 million in funding from the state and private donations. The river has been restored to pristine conditions after removing 400 million tons of debris and other detrimental material and stabilizing the shoreline to protect the area from future monster storms. Not to mention planting a lot of manatee food. How much is a manatee eating on a daily basis? I believe the statistic is that a manatee can eat about 10% of its body weight a day. So you gotta think, if it weighs 1,200 pounds, that's 120 pounds of grass, they have quite the appetite. To satisfy that appetite, more than 450,000 clusters of eelgrass have been planted underwater by hand, creating more than 300 acres of manatee food. I got to help plant the last batch. When seagrass or eelgrass goes in, you plant it, but then it spreads? 
Absolutely. So the, the grass here specifically can spread seven feet in any direction in one year. They sequester nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and they can completely transform a water body that provides benefits to uh, not only the ecosystem, but to the community through ecotourism and, and just healthier, cleaner water. While Crystal River is a shining example of a habitat restoration, manatees elsewhere are threatened by speeding boats and along Florida's east coast in the Indian River Lagoon, starvation. Excessive pollution from development, leaking septic systems, and agricultural runoff have all caused massive algal blooms, killing off the seagrass that manatees rely on. In 2021, a record-breaking 1,100 manatee deaths were recorded statewide and another 800 in 2022. While the number of manatee deaths has decreased this year, experts say they're still at high risk. Ready? One, two, three. Groups like Zoo Tampa rescuing and rehabilitating more than 300 of these lovable creatures. I got to join in and release two of them. Look at her go, look at her go. Would you consider this release a success? 100%. Their story isn't over. We will continue to watch to ensure that these animals continue to stay safe and they continue to do the things that they need to to thrive. The newly released manatees will enjoy what the team likes to call manatee munchies at the manatee snack bar, daily feedings until they're ready to survive on their own. Sea and Shoreline, the company that restored the manatee habitat here, is now turning to the Indian River Lagoon, an even more ambitious undertaking aiming to replicate the success they had at Crystal River. Once you fix it, you don't want to let it go backwards. You have to make people care by showing them what it could be and what can you do to help. From our drone, you can see we've had such a huge morning here throughout the Crystal River. The manatee between the baby and the mom, we saw a pod of mating manatee, and we've just been surrounded by wonder, and that's what you get here, and that's what you get when you think about the power of water, but the power of a community coming together. I mean, it's so cliche until it's not, because we don't do this in so many places to restore nature, and now perhaps restore it to even better than it was 30 years ago before that storm. We really hope that this can be applied to other places throughout Florida, get those waterways back, and get the manatee population back up too. The other thing that they say to help is make sure to keep the speed of boats down. That's how manatee die and get injured. Phil? Oh, Ginger, thanks for that. They are so majestic and beautiful. And you can scan this QR code on the screen for more on the Power of Water initiative this Earth Month. ABC News is exploring the biggest threats to our water system, including lead in our drinking water, drought, and sea levels rising. We hope you'll check that out. There's the QR code. And be sure to tune in to our new ABC News Live special climate crisis, The Power of Water, all part of ABC News' ongoing commitment to climate and environmental-related stories. That's tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on ABC News Live. Take a quick break. We'll be right back. I'm Lindsay Davis. We begin tonight here in Buffalo, London, in Alaska, Uvalde, Kentucky, and Poland. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Did you ever have a conversation about an abortion? Is she lying? Do you have a political aspiration? Absolutely. You ready for this? Go! You're going to deliver a show that will be remembered forever. Ooh, the fresh on me. You are just <laughs> a tough, bad. <laughs> This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. It doesn't get more exciting than that. Even our animation is exciting. Elon Musk's SpaceX is set to launch an uncrewed prototype of its massive Starship rocket. It's designed to eventually carry passengers to the moon and to Mars. Today's test flight comes after Monday's first launch attempt was scrubbed. I want to bring in Katie Coleman right now, uh, former astronaut, to help take us through this. Katie, we are looking at the engine or engines. Uh, there are something like 33 Raptor engines 
on, on this massive rocket. Tell us about Currently it. Currently inside 90 seconds. Next major activity, T minus 40 seconds. Katie, can you hear me? That is a gate, a decision point. At that. Um, the all right, let's it's going to be simply in. amazing. I mean, it, we're less than two minutes, coming up on a minute and a half to go. Like there are so many things that have to happen to make this launch. Uh, but what's so special about this launch is it's a demonstration, it's a test of a capability of sending something really, really large that can take so many people to space instead of just a few. So it's very exciting. We're under a minute now, Katie. I can see by the smile on your face. I mean, being a former astronaut, this must be so exciting. This, of course, is an un, un you know, crewed uh, rocket, but the, the size of the rocket and 33 um, engines is just massive. We should be under 30 seconds now, right? It's true. And actually, just under a minute, 52 seconds. I'm watching on my other screen here. And so what it's going to do, it's going to launch. It's going to go basically most of the way around the Earth. It's going to launch to the east, and it's going to land in just short of Hawaii. And I say land. It's actually going to do a belly flop into the ocean, 37 seconds. The startup sequ sequence of the engine starts at about 8 okay, seconds, so we're just coming up on that. All right, Katie, let's cycle. listen in to the, uh, to the control. Flight director has called a hold. We are recycling. Oh, the moment, did he just we'll say the flight director they called the a hold? Back to. They could hold at T minus 40 seconds. They could go to an earlier point. Give us a minute to listen into the nets. And Katie, we'll is that we what we just heard? The flight director called it a is. hold? That's what I'm hearing as well. And tell us what that means at 40 seconds to launch. Well, it, they've got a lot of ways to monitor the rocket, and the rocket has ways to monitor itself. And as you talked about the, the 33 engines, I'm not sure what sensors or what problem they saw, but with something this complicated, you know, that's why you build in this ability to see what's going on um, before you launch. And so they've clearly seen something that doesn't lead to, or, you know, doesn't lead to a safe launch. So today's not the day, and we'll probably have to wait uh, a little bit, but SpaceX is pretty fast to understand what they saw today. Yeah, and, and Katie, we've seen, you know, shuttles go up and other rockets and, you know, the general public, if, it's, if, if the launch is scrubbed, you see it two days later and it usually goes up just fine. But this is a really precise science. So many things can go wrong, especially with this particular rocket, the heaviest that, that has gone up, 33 engines. Um, you know, talk to us about how careful everyone has to be here. Well, this is the rocket that will actually bring us, bring people to the moon. And that's how careful you have to be. And, and so, um, you know, even though there's no people on board this vehicle, this is a really important test to understand how this vehicle behaves. And it's not just the rocket itself. If we say Starship, and sometimes that's confusing. Starship is, is the name of the spaceship on the top, but it's also the name of the sort of whole rocket complex. And then there's a launch pad underneath that. And this is, you know, they've done a lot of testing of each of the individual parts and phases but there is nothing like putting it all together. And we, we saw that with Artemis as well, and people were like, oh, it's not going, what's wrong? But this is complicated, and thinking basically from the tank farm that yields the pr propellant fueling all the way up to firing those engines, we've never fired this many before, um, it, it's complicated. And you know, I'm, I'm not actually surprised, I'm disappointed just like everybody else, but I'm not actually shocked that they're seeing things just because that is part of Daring mighty things. Again here yeah, and 10 Hawthorne million pounds We're holding a T of fuel. Um, what we've heard try so to put that into context. I mean, we know this is the working. heaviest rocket, and One it's going to be taking people to the moon, maybe even Mars. Uh, hey, let's listen. Could you say that again? That's not unusual. We've held a T minus 40 seconds before to pressurize. That appears to have been resolved. At the same time, on the second stage, they're working some final purging. Uh, we should know very shortly if that is cleared and if we'll continue the countdown. Everyone, especially that person, is excited <laughs> to keep going. <laughs> like John said, we All should right, know Katie, shortly. All right, Katie, so it looks um, like the hold may continue, be released uh, at some point. Uh, did you hear what they said, what they were working uh, on? Minutes and still be able I couldn't to quite hear it either, but yeah, um, clearly they, they saw something. When they said recycle, to me that meant loading, we're not going today, but what they meant, I think, was that there's some sort of system reset and that they could be, they're just in a hold here at 40 seconds and 
um, could very well go. Yeah, it looks like it was a pressurization issue, and you, you yeah. see people up to there. 15 minutes. Up to 15 minutes, yeah, and, and you can see people waiting there. Um, and they, they have a window of 62 minutes, right? Uh, that, that's, that's correct. The, that's the window I see. So, of course, we all want to see it go up, right? right when it's supposed to. Um, Elon Musk tweeted out, you know, 10 minutes to launch, and then we were 40 seconds, and now there's a hold. Let's talk about the significance of this specific rocket and what it will do for space for travel. Just joining, we have a brief well, hold it, um, at the T minus 40 seconds. This rocket mark. proves so um, many different things, and it's so exciting to all of us who think that more people should get to go to space. And the fact that it, it just, it's such a, it's hard to describe the bigness of it. I mean, when you think about the capsule that I went to space in, it just had myself and two other people, and we took up the whole capsule. This, the this volume for the, for the crew is, you know, seven Seven times that. It's just amazing. It's about you know 27 feet. Um, so it's really a big, big space to be able to put payloads, to be able to put equipment, to be able to bring our things to the moon. Figuring out you know leaving rovers there. It's just such a capability, so big. And we were talking about the 33 engines. It looks like they had to relieve pressure. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep hearing the cheering, so I just want to want to listen in for a minute. certainly seems like a good sign, Katie. <laughs> it does. It does. I'm looking as well. So they are counting down from 30 seconds. We are counting down. All right, here we go. Five seconds. this I mean the feeling you get when those engines fire up as we're watching this first how are you feeling and second tell us how this is going well you know I'm not even on that rocket and probably won't be but um, I it, it's I, I just couldn't even speak I don't know if you guys are taking pictures but it's something where and look at those look at that pattern there look at the engines in that picture that is astonishing it's so much power it looks kind of slow as it just it's such a big heavy heavy um, rocket, but it's actually going quite, quite quickly. Yeah, to the untrained eye, it looked like it was slow to come off that launch pad, but... Because it's, it's so much mass, leaving the pad. And look at what it's, look at what it's leaving in its, in its path. It's just, it's remarkable. And now this, this isn't gonna be, uh, they're not gonna attempt a vertical landing here. Um, so when, when eventually correct. it lands, what can we... So there's two parts that land, and they're not really going to land. They're just going to be um, come back. I mean, one is the booster. So this is the, in the at about 2 minutes and 49 seconds. That's when the booster, that's sort of the lower part of the rocket that has the 33 engines, that's when it and the Starship separate. Those engines cut off, the, the stage se separates, and that's when the rocket itself, Starship itself, those six engines will light. Look at look Things at these pictures, good. Katie. Oh my goodness. Preparing for stage separation. Continuing to fly. Two minutes forty seconds. Let's get ready for main engine cutoff. Booster engine cutoff. Beginning the flip for stage separation. This is a big deal, the two parts of the rocket separating. One will fly back, and, but not land.
Katie, does this all look normal to you as it's happening right now? As of right now, we are awaiting stage separation. It looks like stage separation might be a little, let's see. The super heavy a little bit late. Let's listen to them. Yeah, Kate, right now it looks like we saw the start of the flip, but obviously we're seeing from the ground cameras the entire Starship stack continuing to rotate. We should have had separation by now. Obviously, this is uh, does not appear to be a nominal situation. Yeah, it does appear to be spinning, but I do want to remind everyone that everything after clearing the tower was icing on the cake. Whoa. Whoa. Katie. And there, as you saw, as we yes. Promised, an Tell us what just you know, happened there. Um, Everybody's clapping. Was that separation or? So there was. There's two big pieces of this rocket. There's the Starship itself, and there's the booster underneath. The booster had those 33 engines at about two minutes 50 seconds. They were supposed to separate. Where that booster is done, it goes back to Earth. And, uh, and then the Starship's engines light and go, but that separation between those two really big pieces did not happen. And so then it is tumbling as both pieces together, tumbling around, and uh, clearly with the engines um, led to explosions on the vehicle. You know, some, I mean, I'm sure everyone is really is, is disappointed in some ways, but this is very much a test. And this Starship project takes very audacious steps for good reason, because it's the ship that will take us to the moon. Um, the biggest goal for them was to make sure they cleared the launch pad so the launch pad, pad could be used again quickly, because they have, they have, but now this was a development test. Because so they've, even with they've, the explosion, they've got the even with the explosions we just saw, you're saying this is a victory for them because they cleared the launch pad and this is going incrementally in steps. Absolutely. You know, everything from the fueling to being ready to go, sensor systems, you know, all those kinds of things, all those things went well. Engines, you know, they, um, leaving the launch pad. But what's really important about leaving the launch pad, it sounds silly, but if you damage that launch pad, you can't try again very quickly. And that's this is their their modus operandi is to fail. Or not, well, not to fail, but to basically fail often. Take big steps so that you can actually take those steps and see if you can leap ahead as opposed to step, you know, tiny step by tiny step. And so they took a lot of big steps with this launch. The, um, they have vehicles ready to go, starships and boosters ready to put on that pad again. I, I can't say how soon, but that's what's different about the way SpaceX thinks is, you know, let's let's ha take some big steps. With 33 engines, something goes wrong with one of them and you're in trouble. I, I was just speaking to our transportation correspondent, you know Gio Benin as well, and, and he was saying there, there was a good chance that this could happen because of so many engines and because of the unknown. They cleared the pad. Monday was sort of like what they would call a wet launch, and that just means that they went through all the steps to get that Correct. rocket going, but they just, couldn't, they just couldn't get it up. So today, they got that rocket off the pad it went for what, two and a half, almost three minutes, right, right towards separation, and that's where it went wrong. So if this rocket is eventually supposed to bring, you know, astronauts to the moon and to Mars, where are we in that state? You know, what stage are we in, in 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 getting a crew on that rocket after, you know, it just exploded? What three minutes in? We are absolutely a big step ahead. Even though it's not as many steps as we plan to take today, um, we are definitely a step ahead. And that is because so many things had to go right in order for that to leave the pad. And I don't know the nature of the failure, but the, the you know, the, what, what happened was the stages, in other words, the starship, the, the spaceship itself, and the booster, which is the first stage, um, those failed to separate. And so they've got a lot of data. There's tracking. We have the uh, NASA's WB-57 is, is tracking that vehicle. We have a lot of imagery, a lot of, uh, a lot of data telemetry to tell us what was going on. And they'll be more informed in whatever those problems are. They'll work on fixing them. That, that is what, um, that is what engineers do. That is, that is how, how people get to the stars. I know you're not a part of SpaceX, and this is, you may not be able to answer this question, but with, with what we just saw, and you heard the clapping, even at the explosion, you heard everybody clapping because this is the moment the rocket launched. This is what everybody was concerned about. Uh, they needed to get this rocket off that pad, not to, not to explode the pad. And so this was a success. 
immediately. And then for about the next two and a half minutes, everything was going just fine until separation and separation didn't happen. I'm wondering uh, when SpaceX, you know, has the, has the post-mortem for this and gets around and just starts talking about what went right, what went wrong, um, how, obviously they have to be so certain of what they're doing to put a crew in a rocket like that. You know, how many successful launches do you think there needs to, there needs to be of a rocket like this before a crew can get into it? There's, there's a series of milestones. NASA and, and SpaceX, you know, SpaceX has its own uses for Starship, but NASA and SpaceX um, have a partnership. I mean, it's a huge and amazing partnership to put people on the moon. And so you can bet that, you know, NASA is involved here as well. And and I think being very transparent, which SpaceX has shown us, uh, you know, to date, transparent about what they know, what they don't know, what help they can get. NASA's WB-57 was out there watching today, watching, I say, that, you know, that airplane flying flying high and taking very important imagery um, because it is a partnership. So we'll be finding out what happened today. I mean, you mentioned, you know, I, I don't work for SpaceX. I'm retired from NASA. But whenever something launches, whenever something that we know might bring people launches from the Earth, it's something that you know, if you think you don't care about and then you see it happening and you just really do because it represents all of us, you know, being part of our whole universe. And that's what's hard about watching, watching, you know, those kind of results mid-flight. But, uh, you know, each step's important and we'll look at, I say we, because <laughs> I think uh, we're all part of that space family. Yeah, but they'll look at uh, the results. I think you've earned the right to say we. <laughs> you have definitely earned the right to say we. Um, just just a couple a couple other questions. And again, I don't know if you'll know this, um, but do you have any idea how much this just cost? Like this launch? Uh, no idea. But when you think <clears throat> when you think of the cost, or when you think about how people are feeling, and and you know, um, realize how many people. How many people, some of them you, you probably know. I mean, there's so many people that work on a system like this and so many people even that work to share the story like yourselves and in other outlets. I mean, it takes a lot of a, a lot of a piece of so many people to do a launch like this. And yet, you know, Elon set expect. I mean, he said, I want to set low expectations. He said that um, having one engine have a problem that then cascaded and pro caused problems with the other 32 around it was one of the problems that he worried about. And, you know, you know, they've 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 learned a lot here today. They had a have an alternative way, a, a sort of newer way to attach the Starship to the booster, and I'm sure they'll be looking at that. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a big day for a lot of people. Katie, it's such a big part of your life. You went to space. Very few people can say that. Um, I can see the excitement in your face just just watching this, even even when even when things went wrong, um, because it was already a success there. There are people in the country who say, why are we wasting our money on stuff like this? Let's put it to this. What would you say to those folks? Well, a lot. I'd sit them down. <laughs> I'd feed them food. <laughs> and then That's a great talk. way to start, right, right to <laughs> someone's stomach. You know, there's two things, you know, I'm a scientist and we can do experiments in space and, you know, on, on the moon, on Mars. We're we, when we learn things there, we learn things for Earth as well. It is so clear to me that that is true. And that's why as a scientist, we need to go to a place where we can have such different conditions, understanding ourselves, understanding, for example, just think about food. We'll need food when we go to Mars. And so the fact that we can actually, you know, learn how to grow food for Mars it really, though, that knowledge comes right back to needing to grow food and and create food for people right back here on Earth. But the other reason why Starship itself, this rocket, is so important, is the number of people and then and the amount of equipment it can bring. I mean, it just it, it speeds up us getting to the moon, staying there, working there, and also the fact that so many people will get to go. That means. Um, that means they're not all going to look like you and me. I'll be very candid. I felt very special to be able to go to space. But when once you get there, you look down and there's a whole planet down there. And space belongs to all of them. And they and, and every team that is made up of people, you know, that is really diverse, where they come from different places, different backgrounds, that is so important. And it really takes being able to take more of them to space. I mean, just look at being, you know, having a space shuttle instead of the smaller Gemini and Mercury and Apollo capsules, suddenly people like me went to space. You, you talk about how large this particular rocket is. Give us a sense of what you mean by that and, com and compare it to. 
So inside the starship, um, and the start when I say the starship, um, we call it all different things, but it, that's the actual rocket that would have gone to space be, and be orbiting the Earth, go on to the moon. In other words, the part that didn't come off today. Um, inside that is the volume of a 747. Wow. It is 27, about 27 feet in diameter. That I mean, it's just huge. You could put 100 people in there. You can put, I think, 100 and... 50,000 tons in there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not the one with all those numbers that sit in my head, but it is so much more payload. And, and there's also a, an important caveat here, which is the end plan is to have a starship, uh, a, a starship that is actually orbiting the Earth filled with only fuel. And so when you come back from the moon, you can come, you can fuel. I mean, so when you launch, you can I mean, you can fuel up. You can have this in orbit around the moon, you can have it in orbit around the Earth. But it's a, it's a way to not always have everything have to launch from the pad. That makes sense. Katie, before we go, uh, we're watching the end of it, you know, the, obviously the end of what happened today with that explosion. But as you watch this, you, you're, you are a former astronaut. You have seen the world from a perspective that very few people get to see it from. When you watch those engines fire up and you watch that rocket slowly get off the pad, just give me one word. How were you feeling? I, I don't I don't even have one. Okay, give me three. You know, try and not <laughs> <laughs> give me a sentence. I'll, give, I'll take a sentence. A sentence. Just having been on a rocket, it's you, you understand how hard it is to leave the planet and with something that big. Yeah. That complicated that complicated seeing that today was awesome. Yeah. Incredible. Awesome is a good word. And you, your experience and, and, and taking us through this, I really appreciate, Katie. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, a success, even though it exploded, you know? So thank you very much. True. It's hard to think, but it's true. I know. Thank well, you. I'm glad you. I'm glad you cleared that up for us. All right, Katie, thanks. <laughs> Bye. We'll be right back with today's other headlines. Tonight, the abortion pill ruling, millions waiting on the Supreme Court. Plus, after three shootings in a week over apparent mistakes, the new debate over gun laws. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7, straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. The white people of this nation are sick and tired. My mission was to go inside the KKK for the FBI. The KKK wanted to cut my son in pieces. If it came out that Joe was working with the FBI, you'll pay with your blood. How do you go from a cross burning at night to having breakfast with your kids the next morning? I can't quit. That's not an option. Grand Nighthawk infiltrating the KKK. Only on Hulu. Elephants are more like us than we ever thought possible. They speak to each other in ways we're just beginning to understand. It's not just noise. It's an ancient wisdom formed over generations. They'll share their secrets with us. If we only listen.
everyone, I'm Lindsay Davis. We begin tonight here in Buffalo, London, in Alaska, Uvalde, Kentucky, and Poland. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Did you ever have a conversation about an abortion? Is she lying? Do you have a political aspiration? Absolutely. You ready for this? Go! You're going to deliver a show that will be remembered forever. Ooh, the fresh on me. You are just <laughs> a tough, bad <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Time now for the tea, where we break down some of the buzzy stories people are talking about. I love that word, buzzy. And for that, Will Gans is here, buzz, buzz. as always. Buzz, buzz, my friend. Good to see you. What do you I'm got? Glad that rocket did its thing because I have a lot to tell you about let's, today, Phil. Let's do it. We begin with breaking news. Nothing exploding. Nothing exploding, okay. but some explosive headlines, okay. of course. <laughs> From Coachella, as it's about to enter its second weekend, headliner Frank Ocean is officially pulling out of the festival, citing an injury to his leg. Frank Ocean set this past Sunday started an hour late. There was a plan for an ice rink that he scrapped at the last minute, and they had to melt the ice rink. And the pacing of the set overall from reviewers was all over the place. Ocean saying in a statement, it was chaotic. There's some beauty in chaos. It isn't what I intended to show, but I did enjoy being out there, and I'll see you soon. His spot, though, will reportedly be filled by Blink-182. See, I'm not mad about that. No. I like Frank Ocean, but Blink-182 is a, a good follow-up. For anyone who is a fan of music in the 90s, I mean, that's a dream come true. Who isn't a fan of music in the 90s, by the way? Uh, you're a big music guy. I know. Who would your dream Coachella headliner be? <clears throat> well, for you, I'd say Taylor Swift, but I'll go with Bruce Springsteen. For you, yeah, of yeah. course. Well, maybe next year she'll do the Friday night, he'll do the Sunday night. Perfect. We'll take a trip. Heaven. I love it. All right, now to big news for fans of the White Lotus. And by fans of the White Lotus, I mean me, Will Gans. We have our first <laughs> casting announcement for season three of the show, which will be set in Thailand. Natasha Rothwell will be back reprising her role of Belinda, the spa manager from season one. No word on exactly how Belinda will be involved, but last season, before she died, Tanya said about Belinda, sometimes I think I should have started that spa for poor women with the girl from Maui. Maybe she put a curse on me. So who knows? Maybe... Can we just say one thing? Yeah. I haven't watched season two yet. Are you serious? <laughs> I watched season one, and now I know what happens to Belinda. So thank you very much, Will Gans. Well, it's still worth the watch. All right, I got to tell you. I'll watch. Excited to see what Belinda does in season three, though. All right, next, call me Maury, because we're digging into an unsolved paternity mystery. Last week, Matthew McConaughey told Kelly Ripa that his mother knew Woody Harrelson's father. Now Woody Harrelson says it's the way that Mrs. McConaughey said it, uh, I knew yeah. your father, that has him thinking. Harrelson adding that he's done the math and it makes sense. The year of McConaughey's birth, nine months before, his mom was on a break from her relationship with his supposed father. Woody says he and Matt are both down to take a DNA test. So stay tuned. It was, it was the air quote she used when she said that. that I got knew him thinking. his father. I knew your father. I know. I could kind of see it, though. They kind of have similar vibes. What, like, a wild, that, what a wild story that would be, right? It would be incredible. I mean, and I love, like, Hollywood siblings, like the whole Kate Hudson, Goldie Hawn, all of that. Even the yeah. ones who don't know they were siblings. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and finally, you brought up Taylor Swift. I'm going to bring it full circle. She's breaking records with her Eras tour, on track to be the highest grossing U.S. tour by a female artist ever. It turns out... We're all in our era's era. Taylor's music catalog has skyrocketed in streaming since the tour kicked off, especially the second song in her set list, Cruel Summer, which has entered the U.S. Top 50 for the first time since she released it back in 2019. And that's only the beginning. After kicking off her tour in Arizona last month, many of Swift's songs have seen a sharp increase in streams, including Miss Americana and the Heartbreak Prince, up 470%, Fearless Taylor's version up 360% in streaming, and You Need to Calm Down, which has risen 175% in listeners. That's how good she is. Songs that don't make it, make it. Right. Years later. Years later. That's how good she is. And I know, I know you love her, so that was... That was really a gift to me, from me. <laughs> Best kind of gift there is. That's right. <laughs> Will Gans, thanks so much. Thanks, Bill. Always good to see you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops. Will doesn't either. We'll be right back. <laughs> the coffee. <laughs> The white people of this nation are sick and tired. My mission was to go inside the KKK for the FBI. 
the KKK, you wanted to cut my son in pieces. If it came out that Joe was working with the FBI, you'll pay with your blood. How do you go from a cross burning at night to having breakfast with your kids the next morning? I can't quit. That's not an option. Grand Nighthawk infiltrating the KKK. Only on Hulu. Tonight, the abortion pill ruling, millions waiting on the Supreme Court. Plus, after three shootings in a week over apparent mistakes, the new debate over gun laws. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7, straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Elephants are more like us than we ever thought possible. They speak to each other in ways we're just beginning to understand. It's not just noise. It's an ancient wisdom formed over generations. 